So as I said, the trial of um, Gleebeck versus Interferon and, and Cytarabine was term, terminated early because it was clear that Gleebeck was so much better, both in terms of tolerance but also in terms of response. And so uh, the most of this, the, the, this, so this is this trial, this IRIS trial, but what happened was that pretty much everybody who got started on the interferon and RSE ended up back over on, on Gleevec because it was clear it was better. Um, but they then continued to follow the group that just initially got Gleevec out for many years. And so uh, the, this is really just the group who initially got Gleevec on that very first sort of trial um, and showing that, that the, in those people, about 6% at seven years had died of their disease uh, from CML. So there are a few more that had died of other reasons, been you know, run over by a bus or um, eaten by a great white or something like that. But the, um, the, the, re the very sort of relatively small numbers of patients who had, had died from their, their disease. Before we go any further, it's sort of uh, this is where uh, I guess a talk on CML gets, gets tricky in that we use a lot of different definitions of response and so the the idea is that we can detect disease in uh, the blood and the bone marrow um, but then we use different thresholds to say oh you've made it down this far and then you've made it a bit further and then you've made it a bit further and so complete hematological response is where your blood film now looks normal and your blood counts look normal and that often happens fairly early on in the course of treatment um, a major cytogenetic response we often don't even assess anymore. That was sort of back when we used to do regular bone marrows, which not, you know, not many of us do too much anymore. Um, and so that's, uh, that, that was when you had less than 35% um, uh, chrome of, of the Philadelphia cells in your bone marrow. Complete cytogenetic response is where you don't have any of the Philadelphia cells in your bone marrow. So you're sort of getting down to lower and lower levels of, uh, you know, of detectable disease. A major molecular emission is where the percentage of sort of abnormal cells, if you like, in your blood is only 0.1% or less. And so that's a fairly major endpoint. And the reason why it's a fairly major endpoint is that um, it, it does seem to be a level, if you get below that, then your chances of progression are pretty small. So there's really only been you know, a handful or a few or a few a couple of handfuls of patients around the world who've who've sort of progressed from that level, providing they continue to tolerate the medicine. And so, um, that and because of that, that's also now been an end point in a lot of trials. And so, you know, we, the the trials are actually determining when they compare one drug to another, they determine how many people get into that major molecular response. And then there is another level below that, which is a complete molecular response. And this is where it gets a bit murky because really complete molecular response means we can't detect the disease at all, but that depends on how good your test is. And so uh, there are lots of different ways of testing this. There, there, there's a standard PCR test, which most of us use you know, in, in general practice, but there are you know, more and more uh, research-oriented methods to detect uh, uh, down to lower levels. And, um, and so really, you know, complete molecular response just means you, you, you've responded down to a level below which we can detect you, but that depends on how good our test is. And to try and get around that, they've sort of created these other levels which are a level of response of sort of four, which is 0.01 of a percent, and 0.45, which is 0.0032 percent. And so, um, I'll talk about this one later because this MR 4.5 or molecular response 4.5 stands for 4.5 logs below the below the uh, below diagnosis. So each log is you know reduced by a tenth. So it's a, a, you know down to a tenth, down to a tenth, down to a tenth, four and a half times, um, and that's sort of been a definition which we're then using to have to now say that you're in complete molecular response, even though we might be able to detect you at 0.0031%. Um, we're saying you're in complete molecular emission because that's just a standard that we're sort of trying to use um, uh, so that we can sort of know we're, what we're doing rather than, you know, have to compare my test to somebody else's test. All right, and so the importance of that is that uh, as you then look at the people from this IRIS trial, so these are the people who were initially treated with Gleevec, 
the longer you stay on the drug, the deeper your response seems to be. And so the people in yellow here have achieved that major molecular response. So you can see that if you only look at 12 months only on Gleevec, on this trial, only about half of the people will have achieved a major molecular response. Whereas if you look out here at sort of whatever that is, six years, um, then uh, you, you're getting sort of 90% or so who will have achieved a major molecular response. So some people take a long time to get there, but um, it, it, the longer you stay on the drug, the, the, the better your response tends to be. Um, and similarly, if you look at the next level down, which would be we'd now call an MR4, you know, the, again, you, more and more people over time uh, achieving that, that level of response. And what that means is that most of the people who progress on these drugs do it in the first year or two or three, you know, probably a year or two. Um, and as you get along, there's, there's less and less people progressing because people are in deeper and deeper remissions. And we know that the deeper your remission is, the less chance you've got of, uh, of progressing. Um, and so, uh, you know, th this is, is the... Is Sorry? Uh, uh, it doesn't seem to be. So this, you know, this is a blip, but it seems that this is getting, you know, the, the risk of progression is lower and lower as the years go on. Um, and yes, as I said before, you know, if you're in MMR, it's not totally safe, but it's, but your, the, the, the chance of progressing from MMR is very small. So the other importance of uh, worrying about where you get to, um, it, it, as I said before, uh, you, the deeper you go, the, the less likely you are to progress, but also it's time dependent. And so if, so if you do get a deeper level earlier, then it just gets you into a safer zone earlier, if you like. And so this is just one example, and I could, you know, I could throw you, the, there's hundreds and hundreds of these graphs, but if we look at people, and it doesn't matter what they did up until 12 months, so they've just taken a uh, people who are on this trial at 12 months on, um, on Gleevec, then if you did achieve this major molecular emission, this is your chance of not progressing, if you like. So, you know, your chance of not progressing if you're in major molecular emission on this trial was about, what, 98, 99% or something like that. Whereas if you didn't achieve this complete cytogenetic remission by, by 12 months, then this is your chance of progressing. So still, you know, more than 70% of people haven't progressed, um, but, but they've got a higher chance of, of, of progressing. Um, and so that's why we have certain thresholds that we like to meet to sort of see that, you know, pa patients are sort of traveling and getting into the safest zone possible. Um, and really then this is um, uh, an attempt to put this in a table. And so this is the, the European leukemia net where they've just basically created a table of what they consider based on the current evidence is, you know, optimal outcomes. So getting less than these certain levels of BCR able at these time points versus outcomes where you're, where you're a bit worried, you know, may not mean that you change anything, but you're, you know, a bit worried and want to watch a bit more closely. Um, and then uh, levels that are, that they would consider a, a failure where we may be having to think about doing something different. But the difficulty with this and even this is that at the moment we don't have a lot of data about what that something different is. And so we can tell you that we're a bit worried or we, we think that this isn't working fantastically, but we can't really necessarily tell you that you're going to do better with anything else. Would you go back to a bone marrow in that case? Perhaps. So, so certainly uh, we, 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 we do have people who fail these levels and then, you know, we might try a second drug and then if they look like they're similarly failing the second drug, then they go on to bone marrow. So, we, you know, bone marrow is still being done for CML, but you have to be usually pretty young. So a bone marrow transplant is generally only considered if you're less than about sort of 65, sometimes 70 at a stretch. Um, uh, and you, and you has to be a really sort of good reason to do it these days, which is usually having failed at least two drugs uh, and, and uh, so, so, so sometimes considered still. Um, 
So getting back then to the fact that there are now multiple drugs other than, than Gleevec, so this is um, the bcr able protein that I was showing before sideways. This is now looking at it front on, so it's like a little Pac-Man, you know, looking front on. So this is Gleevec sitting in the little groove of the, of the, the protein. And this just shows you that the, the, the different drugs have just been designed to sit in that groove slightly differently. Um, and the importance of that is that the way that we that a number of patients who don't who sort of where Gleevec doesn't work, they, it doesn't it it may not work because they have mutations within this protein which changes the structure of the protein a bit where the Gleevec can't get into the groove, if you like. And then these newer drugs, nilotinib and dasatinib, also have some mutations that occur in that protein where they can't get into the groove as well. And so if, it, if things aren't going as we plan, then we do try and look for these mutations to see if, uh, you know, if we can identify the reason why the, that particular drug's not working and it may be that it's not getting into where it's, to where it's needed. And you can see that there are certain mutations that, you know, that don't, that, that are resistant to nilotinib and there's certain mutations that are resistant to dasatinib and so if we find one of these mutations, it may help choosing which drug to go to next in some patients. There's also one mutation that's basically resistant to all three of the, you know, the currently licensed drugs, um, that there is a, another drug which is being used sort of in trials largely around the world for that, that, that other mutation. Uh, 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 it's a, quite, quite a complicated test. Um, uh, but it is available in different centres around Australia. Um, it's generally only considered if, uh, if we think that patients aren't responding to the treatment. It's not necessarily uh, because if we look at it in everybody at the start, they, it's never there. So it's, it's a, it's a, they're, they're mutations which are sort of selected out as you go along on treatment rather than mutations that were sort of uh, there at the start when the, when the disease was initially discovered. Really, this is just to show you that because potentially because they've got less you know, mutations, there do appear to be slightly deeper responses to um, some of the newer drugs. So nilotinib and dasatinib, but but I'll tell I'll tell you why that's not necessarily a, a, a you know the, the why we why we haven't just switched everybody along onto the newer drugs in a second. So um, this is the trial looking at. Um, the people who are on nilotinib versus imatinib and more, the blue bars are nilotinib, so more of them had achieved a major molecular emission on nilotinib than, than Gleevec. Similarly, this is the trial looking at dasatinib Gleevec. So again, more people had achieved a major molecular emission on dasatinib than Gleevec. Um, and on the trial of nilotinib, there did appear to be less people that progressed during the initial sort of, as I said, year or so of treatment um, uh, on the nilotinib arm, less people progressing compared to the imatinib arm. And so it does seem that the newer drugs might be better at getting you down quickly to, to a, a lower level um, and therefore, you know, hopefully protecting you against progression. The, the downside of that is that there are a couple of sort of significant side effects that we worry may be occurring with some of the newer drugs. Um, so this is the side effects that you expect um, from uh, uh, the, this is again the, the comparison of, of, of nilotinib versus Gleevec. And the important thing is that you get more nausea, muscle spasms, muscle aches, diarrhea and vomiting with Gleevec, um, but more rash, headaches, itchiness and hair loss with um, nilotinib. So that, you know, they've got particular side effects that we can, we can look out for. You get more in the way of swelling with, uh, with, with Gleevec, so more in the way of swelling in your legs or swelling in your face with Gleevec compared to the, to the new drugs. Um, 
and then this is the um, the data looking at then desatinib. So that's this is the other one rather than nilotinib, and you can see that again the orange bars are Gleevec, so more of this swelling, more muscle aches with Gleevec, more nausea with Gleevec, but desatinib's got a particular side effect that we watch out for, which is where it causes a pleural effusion, which is fluid outside your lungs, sort of inside your chest, but outside your lungs. Um, and so that can be problematic if it happens. We need to sort of obviously manage that if it happens, uh, which is can often be managed very successfully, but, but it's one that we, we watch out for on, on that particular drug. Um, and so really then, uh, because of that, uh, we, you know, as I said, it's not a straightforward decision as to which drug you, you, you should go on. You know, there are some that appear to be a little bit better at getting the, the levels down quickly, but, you know, they may have other specific side effects that your doctor's particularly, you know, worried about that, that you know, lead them to choose one drug over, over another.